Um, all right, guys. Well, I am Nathan Miller. I am the worship and youth pastor, as I mentioned earlier. And the message I'm going to bring to you today is, is a huge topic. There's a monstrous amount of things I could say. In the last couple of days, I've really just been praying that the Lord would give me wisdom and what, out of all the many, many things I could say on this topic, what I will say. Um, but before I kind of let you know what it is, uh, if you've heard of Gandhi, who's heard of Gandhi? Mahatma Gandhi, most of you. Uh, perhaps you know that he was a well-known leader in the movement for India to become independent from Britain. Uh, he was an advocate for nonviolent resistance, much like Martin Luther King Jr. was here in the United States. Uh, he's a compelling individual to many and not a Christian. Uh, and today I'm not going to talk about what I think about Gandhi, uh, but I want to bring up a quote that I've seen from him that is extremely impactful in today's world, and that'll be up here on the screen. Tell me if you've heard this quote, be the change you wish to see in the world. You guys have encountered this, right? Be the change you wish to see in the world. This is often attributed to Gandhi. There's no evidence that he actually ever said it or wrote it, but here's what he did say. He said, if we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. We need not wait to see what others do. So pretty close, be the change is just a little bit shorter, a little bit snappier. But what Gandhi actually said was basically that. You gotta change yourself. Don't worry about what others are doing. You just gotta change yourself. Now, it's obvious, I think, at least to a Christian, this idea is pretty close to something that was said before him. Something that was said by, in fact, Jesus. Jesus said in Mark 12, 31, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, do the things to others that you would want them to do to you, which we're, I think, used to. But at the time Jesus said it, it was revolutionary. At the time Jesus said it, about the best people had was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. In other words, don't hurt somebody, and if you do, you're going to get hurt back about the same amount. Fair is fair. But Jesus actually changed it into a law of love. Love others actually do things to other people that you would have them do to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And for a long time, even though I knew this idea started with Jesus, I thought Gandhi's advice was pretty good. I thought Gandhi's advice to be the change, I'll use that phrase because it's a summary of what he did say. I thought Gandhi's advice to be the change you want to see in the world was good advice. Helpful, catchy, uh, and I've realized that I was wrong. And I want to tell you about that today. Uh, I preached, one of my recent sermons, I preached about how when I was a young Christian, I read the Gospels. I started with Gospel of Luke. I didn't stop there. And it really changed my life. And I realized in that moment, I realized if Christians would do this, I think the world would look better. I think Jesus would be more attractive to people if, G if people actually obeyed the commands of Jesus. And by the way, I still believe that. And so I imagined, well, if no one else is going to love their neighbor, well, I am. Gandhi uh, is seen as a hero by many. He, he went on a hunger strike that worked, that achieved Indian independence. His example was inspiring. And I wanted to be like that for Christians. I wanted to be an inspiring hero for Christians in my level of obedience and self-sacrifice. One passage that really convicted me was Jesus' judgment on the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. I don't know if you're familiar. In Matthew 25, Jesus says that the final judgment, he condemns uh, the goats for not giving him things that he needed, for not doing things for him that he needed, for not loving him. And he praises the sheep for doing all these things. And then he reveals that when it was done for the least of these, my brothers, it was done for him. I'll look at a couple of verses from this passage. Matthew 25, uh, he says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Wow, I thought. 
Christians need to be doing this stuff. And I was right. I was not incorrect about that. But I didn't know where else to start, so I just decided to start doing it myself. I tried to start doing all the things. And sometimes I had like-minded people around me. Sometimes I didn't. And often it was really hard. Often it was confusing. But I was committed. And I decided if, if other Christians weren't going to do this stuff, well, I, I was going to do it. I wanted to be the change. I wanted to be the change that I wanted to see in the world. I took that idea to heart. I see this in the world all the time. People wanting to be the change, to do themselves what they believe everyone else should do. At times, this is fine, and it works great. Like, if you choose to recycle every day because you want other people to recycle, that's not going to hurt anything. If, you're, if you commit to reading the Bible every morning because you wish other people would follow your example and read the Bible every morning, that's great. That's not going to hurt anything. It might even inspire other people. Won't hurt you. Won't hurt anyone else. Unless it does. You see, many people want to be the change in a way that actually alienates them from others. And they know it. And they're fine with it. Because being the change is the most important thing to them. Trying to accomplish their vision, your vision for what the world should look like, uh, might be the most important thing to you, which can then alienate you from other people. Whether it's refusing to wear shoes, refusing to eat meat, refusing to eat vegetables, whatever... Uh, you know the kind of world you want to live in, and you're going to live in it whether anyone else lives there or not. College students, am I right? I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, sometimes this way of thinking actually leads us to ignore or destroy relationships with our parents and loved ones simply because they can't get on board with whatever we think the most important crusade is. Now, I'll tell you guys, in my story, fortunately, I was saved from this kind of excess by getting a piece of wisdom from another Christian who I admired. He was really into a lot of this kind of stuff, but he said, let love be your first rule. And he gave an, because he would do a thing called simple living, where during Lent, he would not drive his car, not eat at restaurants, live, spend no money and live really simply. But he was basically like, be loving about it. Like, if you always go to Cracker Barrel with your mom every Saturday, still go to Cracker Barrel during Lent. Like, let love be your first rule. Live simply, do, do the things for Jesus, be the change to some extent, but let love be your first rule. And that was helpful for me. That was a helpful guide. And never mind how it might hurt others when we try to be the change. I actually believe it might hurt you when you try to be the change. If your commitment is to being the change above all other commitments, you might end up making foolish decisions that paralyze your ability to function in society. Or, I deal with this a lot, you'll feel constantly guilty, whether for not recycling enough, not volunteering enough, eating the wrong foods, not giving away your money enough, or how about this one, not doing enough for the kingdom of God. And I think all of those are good things, by the way. But God never asked you as an individual to be the change. The real saving grace was when I, when I learned something about Christianity, it isn't meant to be done individually. I was trying to do Christianity Gandhi's way. I needed to do it Jesus' way. I've got a slide for that. I was trying to do Christianity Gandhi's way. I needed to do it Jesus' way. I'm going to give you an example of this. One of the things that I decided I was going to do was I was going to serve the homeless in my city. And Jesus says some really shocking things in the Gospel of Luke. He says, give to everyone who asks. What? What? I didn't know what to do with that, but I felt pretty sure I wasn't doing it, and I was pretty sure nobody else was doing it either. And we got into a situation where a friend of mine met a guy who was very evidently mentally disturbed and homeless, and she was going to try to get him into sort of a Christian halfway house to get him back on track with his life. And she said, hey, the halfway house opens on Monday. It's the weekend could he come stay at your house? Me and Dustin lived together. We were single guys and roommates, and we were like, sure, bring him on. 
So this guy came and stayed at our house and evidently he was heavily demonized or schizophrenic or both. And it was extremely scary and difficult having him in our house from the first day. And we prayed over him and, and Dustin didn't know as much then about freedom ministry as he does now. He learned a lot during this experience. But, but this guy kind of stayed in this highly demonized state the whole time we knew him. And we prayed over him and we ministered to him and we loved him and we gave him a place to sleep. And honestly, I could write a book about this experience. A lot of cool things happened. But for our purposes today, I'll tell you this. Monday came around and this Christian halfway house, we told them about the guy because we'd now known him for a couple days. And they were like, oh no, we can't handle that. That's not what we do. And I was like, shoot. Because this guy was living in my apartment. I was in constant fear and anxiety during this time, praying all the time, a lot of sweet moments with the Lord, but I don't mind admitting to you, constant fear and anxiety this entire, and he was with us for about three weeks. And here's the thing, you guys, I believed I had to let him stay with me because I believed that's what Jesus wanted me to do. I thought Jesus said to give to everyone who asks, and I thought this is what that meant. So I didn't see any other option does Jesus want me to kick this schizophrenic, demonized guy out? That's what I thought. <laughs> it seems obvious. And you guys, this story, I, I, I hope the best for this guy, but this, the story I'm telling you today is not going to be about him. It's, it's about me and about Dustin. Three weeks in, uh, the girl who had originally brought him, she was praying for him. And the Lord led her in her Bible to the passage in Genesis where Abraham sacrifices Isaac. And the Lord gave her an interpretation and it was, you guys need to let him go. You need to let him go and trust God. And there were some elders from a church that we had been, after we were just run ragged, we started consulting other believers. Some elders from a, from a church that we knew had been giving us advice. And one of them called us exact same thing, had been praying for us. The Lord had led him to the passage in the Bible where Abraham sacrifices Isaac. And he got the exact same interpretation for us that we needed to let this guy go. And the, the two were not talking to each other. So it was a very clear confirmation of revelation from the Holy Spirit that we needed to let this guy go. And the, the image I wanna leave you with is that when I was trying to be the change, I got myself into a situation I couldn't figure out how to get out of. But it was actually the church coming around, listening to the voice of the Spirit, giving me counsel that got me out of this situation. I don't know where I would have been without those people. That guy might, that guy might still be living with us for all I know. And here's what we did. On a Saturday, we told him, hey man, we believe you need to leave, it's time. He was very angry and we were scared. But then he actually calmed down and we prayed. And I remember that last Saturday night sitting out on the porch with him and we're singing and we're worshiping together. And he said, you know what? I just saw a vision of myself as an old man and I'm free. And the next day we took him to, we went ahead and took him to a Pentecostal church and had them pray over him, just can't, couldn't hurt. And then we took him to a train station and bought him a train ticket for where he wanted to go. We let him choose, and I've never seen him again. One thing I do know, you guys, is I, I, I had done all that I could for that guy. It wasn't going to get any better for him or for me. But I realized in that situation, I can't do this by myself. It sounded great when I was reading books. And it was just me imagining how amazing it was going to be, how I'm the Christian who serves the homeless. I nearly destroyed myself trying to do that. You guys, I don't have a rosy view of that experience. It was awful. I think Dustin kind of does because he learned how to cast out demons and he'll, he'll tell that story differently. For me, it was just awful. And without the Lord helping us in that, without other believers listening to the Holy Spirit, I don't know what I would have done. I learned that God wants us not to be the change but to be 
the church. God does not have for you as individuals to be the change. He wants us to be the church. Now, when I bring this up to you, I actually think that most of the people that I know here at Wellspring are pretty good at this. I think that you value the local church. I do. But what I want to make sure I give to you today then is permission to rest in that. The burden is not on you as individuals. It's on us. The burden to do these things, to evangelize the world, to obey Jesus, we do that together. Not only do we do it together, we help each other to do it well together. And for those of you, uh, John running slides, I'm going to skip down a little bit. So what happened is this. Jesus came, the perfect son of God. He taught, he did miracles. He showed us what perfect submission to the Father was, what perfect power in the Holy Spirit was. He died for the sins of the world. He rose from the grave showing that he had defeated death on the cross. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he poured out the Spirit on his church us. You guys, we live in a very highly individualized society that sometimes sees that entire narrative as what Jesus did for me. But at least as appropriate is a way of seeing that Jesus did that for us to create a people. It's interesting to me that in Matthew 25, when Jesus says, I was hungry, you gave me all food. I was thirsty, you gave me all drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. He's actually using the plural you. You guys. You all, every one of those yous is plural. You guys did this for me. You sheep, you did this for me. Also interesting to me is in Revelation. You remember Jesus has some, there's some praises, but mostly rebukes to seven different churches. It's collective. He's praising, praising them as a body. He's rebuking them as a body. Paul does this in some of his letters. Remember there was Judaizing going on in the Galatian shirts? Oh, you foolish Galatians. He doesn't go down the list and say, well, you were Judaizing. You were pretty good. He says, you guys are Judea. You guys are leaving behind the gospel. In Corinth, where they were permissive of sexual sin, he said, you guys think you're smart. You're fools. <laughs> Paul was harsh when he needed to be. And he praised them some. He praised the Ephesian church. He praised churches for their generosity. He praises them as a group. The picture of the New Testament, I think a lot more than we realize, is us. And I want to try to get at maybe um, some ways that we, we sometimes miss this or skip over it when we see it in the New Testament. First of all, in Acts 2, I love that when the Holy Spirit falls for the first time on the church, it says there was no needy among them. You remember that? They were taking care of each other. But it's interesting that what it doesn't say is that they sold their property and they, they each found different poor people and helped them out. It says they sold their property and laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet. They gave to the church collectively and the church helped out the poor. The church distributed they did it corporately. They loved the poor and there were no needy among them, but they did it corporately. Get this, in Acts 6, you see this interesting moment um, where the apostles decide to appoint others to care for the poor because they need to focus on prayer and teaching. In Acts 6, verses 2 and 3, it says, The twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Now, this duty is basically taking care of how they're going to distribute to some poor members of the church. Notice they say they need to be men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom. This is not a minor task to the apostles. This is actually really important to them. 
They want this to be done in a godly way. Even if this administrative task needs to be done by men full of the Holy Spirit. I just love that. But it shows that the church need, they, the apostles deemed that the church needed to handle it. It needs to be handled by the, the body, by the community. And by the way, uh, I actually think we do this really well at Wellspring. We handle the way that we give and, and benevolence and things like that as a body. I, I'm proud of how we do that. And what should be comforting about this, you guys? There's other passages that underscore this. I'm gonna move past them for now. What should be comforting about this is to know that you as an individual can't do it alone. You need the plurality of the church, which means, and I wanna be very clear about this. If a person wants to take and take from you as an individual, perhaps abusing your generosity, but they don't want any part of the church or of Jesus, the New Testament doesn't have a category for that. I keep skipping over passages and then realizing I can't skip over them. So I'm gonna to go to one of the passages I just skipped over. Uh, Paul actually talks about the kind of widows that they should give to. And it's fascinating what he says. This is, I remember this kind of disturbed me as a young fired up Christian. Paul says this in 1 Timothy, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Now, Paul also does say that individuals should take care of their own families first, but if the widow is truly alone, then the church should take care of her. But he gives a pretty strict overview of her character for this. And the implication is that if she wants to receive help from the church, but doesn't want to serve the church or live as a Christian, she doesn't get helped by the church. That's surprising. At least it was to me. But the implication here is that everything that the church does has to be overseen. It has to be done with wisdom. Now, is the church free to give more, more freely than this? I think so. This is Paul's advice to them and how to do this with widows specifically. But I'm telling you guys, I've tried to do the thing where I gave with no wisdom, without requiring anything of the people I was giving to, and it hasn't worked well. I've, I think, always benefited when I've chosen to do things to obey Christ. I don't regret ever doing that. But trying to do things apart from the church, apart from other believers, has often been difficult and in some cases nearly catastrophic for me. Fascinating to me to see that the early church never, apparently never considered this. They never considered it was a bunch of individual Christians obeying Jesus, getting out there and doing this stuff. They did it together. They did it corporately. It was overseen. I think that's amazing. It was interesting. Yesterday, I was, uh, I was making myself a little iced coffee. You know how you do in the summer. And one of the things is you never want your iced coffee to get watered down because that's the worst. But you ever notice this? If you put a couple ice cubes in there and it's into a warm drink, what's gonna happen? They're gonna melt. They're gonna get, it's gonna get instantly watered down, right? In order to keep it from getting watered down, you actually have to add a bunch more ice. And then that ice actually changes the temperature of the drink. You guys, don't be a lone ice cube. I'm serious. I think you're just going to get melted into the warm drink when you try to do that. If it's the church, then we can actually change the temperature of the drink. Does that make sense? Yeah, the Lord was preaching that to me yesterday <laughs> over my iced coffee. Here's something else I think is fascinating. We don't see any instances where Paul goes off. You remember Paul? Apostle, writer of scripture, we don't ever see any instances where Paul goes off on a missionary journey alone. Does that kind of blow your mind a little bit? His first journey, it's, it's Paul and Barnabas. And here's what's fascinating to me. Another journey, uh, Paul doesn't travel with Barnabas. Instead, he travels with Silas. And do you know the reason? Do you remember the reason? They disagreed over who to take with them. 
Paul was disappointed in something that a young man named John Mark had done. And so instead of taking John Mark, he wanted to take Timothy. Notice it never crossed Paul's mind to go by himself. It never even crossed his mind apparently to go with just him and Silas or him and Barnabas. We have to take someone with us. We've got to take some of the young dudes we're discipling with us. That's obvious. The only question is which one. And that's what they argued about. They, I don't think they hated each other. They just went on separate journeys, but took different people with them and took young people they were discipling with them. Paul didn't go off alone. You guys, if Paul can't be a Christian alone, then neither can you. I promise you that. And what this means for us, my friends, is I, I wanna invite you to see yourself this morning as a child who's a part of a family. I, if you feel a lot of guilt for what you should be accomplishing individually, if you feel a lot of weight for the things that you wanna do for the kingdom, God can use that, but I want you to see yourself as a child who's a part of a family. I wanna see yourself like you're in the back seat of the minivan. You know what I mean? You don't have to drive the minivan. You can sit in the minivan. You can be a part of the family. Now, uh, many of you are probably aware that yesterday we lost uh, a pastor named Tim Keller. I say we. He wasn't a part of this church. He uh, was well known. He was a pastor who was probably most famous for planting a thriving church in New York City. Tim Keller uh, planted a thriving church in New York City. He faithfully taught the Bible. He was so smart. And he was actually an equipper of church planters. He passed away yesterday at 73. But his legacy was that you can actually do a lot of good, even in a city like New York City, as a church. And Tim Keller wasn't a hype guy. I remember Megan and I once visited New York City, and we had a lot of time on Sunday, so we visited two different churches. One of them was a famous, hip, uh, charismatic church scene that had nine services <laughs> and a popular pastor. And the other one was, was Tim Keller's church, Redeemer Presbyterian. Uh, the first church we visited, it was awesome. We loved it. We were jazzed when we walked out of there. Um, but we noticed something. Megan uh, prayed for someone to be healed there, and they, they felt some relief. It was really cool. But they told us they'd been going to this church for four years and had never been prayed for. At this big scene, this big quote-unquote charismatic, spirit-filled church, they'd never been prayed for before. Is it a coincidence? I don't know, but yeah, that church is in the news a lot these days. Uh, their pastor has flamed out. The pastor of that local congregation has also flamed out. Tim Keller's church, it wasn't a big hypey scene. It was pretty calm. The Bible was faithfully preached. Some Presbyterian baptisms happened where they kind of sprinkle a little bit of water on your head. Um, we sang some hymns. But it was right there in the Upper West Side. They've been there, I believe, since the 80s, and they're still there now, preaching the gospel maintaining a presence in the heart of New York City week in and week out, declaring the goodness of Jesus. You guys, what Tim Keller gave us as a church, so many good things, but one of them was a vision for how to reach a city. And he was strategic. You guys, if there was anybody that could have been uber celebrity pastor and kind of done his own thing, it was, it was him. He was strategic. He intentionally shared the gospel in a way that was going to make sense to New Yorkers. He did that on purpose. He intentionally quoted from scientific journals and from secular news articles, and he understood psychology, and he understood history, and he understood things that matter to skeptical non-believers, and he preached the gospel to them. But what he also did was he did not allow himself to be uh, a sole leader of this organization. He had other pastors, other leaders, other elders. In fact, when Megan and I visited, he didn't preach that day. Somebody else preached, and it was great. 
Tim Keller intentionally didn't make it about Tim Keller. He didn't name his ministry after himself, didn't name his church after himself. He set up something really beautiful, he and his wife and a a small team, and he made sure that he was a pastor at a church. And that was his legacy. Still reaching the heart of New York City. Something else I think is really cool, a little closer to home. Uh, You guys know Pastor Dustin. (laughs) He's over there serving kids. (laughs) serving kids today, which uh, I love that he does that. He chooses to do that periodically so he can also pastor over there and see what God's doing. Uh, When Dustin came to this church, he had already established a regimen of evangelism. He went out often to share the gospel in public. And when he came here, he was a church planning resident, and Michael Roundtree, who was the pastor, was like, Dustin, let's figure out your job description. Dustin was like, okay, well, in my last church, I wasn't really allowed to go out and just share the gospel all the time. And Michael's like, what? He's like, well, why don't you just do that? Just go evangel crazy and let's see what happens. That's what Michael Roundtree told Dustin. So Dustin now had a job where he basically kept doing what he had been doing faithfully for years, but with this critical difference. It was now formally a part of what he was doing through the local church. And as his very close friend, I noticed a couple of differences. One is that people knew about it and they could go with him. You guys, don't hear me saying you shouldn't start ministries or do things. But I think ideally you would take people with you. You'd be quick to ask advice, quick to consult. And number two, and I can't fully explain this, but the fruitfulness of Dustin going out and evangelizing exploded. The fruitfulness exploded. He was taking people with him and he saw, I I feel like he saw seven people get saved a week, maybe more. In those first days here at Wellspring, that was his only job. You guys, it didn't hurt what he was going out and doing already to make it formally a part of the local church. It only helped it. I love, Hunter mentioned all the money that came in for the bake sale. I love seeing that because we've seen two extraordinary things. One is we've seen a lot of families of teens who are really struggling financially, who've let us know, I think more than I've ever seen, this year, people letting me know we really, we can't afford it this year or we can't afford all of it this year. I really need help this year. But also seen an extraordinary amount of people saying, I wanna help, I wanna send teens, I wanna give money. And we're able to do that because it's going through the church. We don't have to organize that on an individual basis. We can run through a functioning uh, body of Christ. I wanna say this really quickly because I do think it's probably important Am I the only one that sometimes gets confused by what's actually a church? Anybody else? You're like, how do you define this? And if you study church history or ecclesiology, you feel like there's 90 different definitions of it. So I wanna give you something that I actually find really encouraging. Uh, There's there's two Greek words. I'm not gonna put them up around the screen, but two Greek words that you see in scripture. One, presbuteros. Presbuteros. This is the word that we translate elder. It's a good translation of the word, elder. Uh, In other English-speaking churches, such as the Catholic Church, they might translate that word priest. But it's the Greek word presbuteros, and it basically means someone who has responsibility to oversee the local church. And there's another word, episcopae, which is overseer. So in the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, they might call, they would translate that bishop. So one little difference, it's not a major difference, but we would see those things due to some of the ways they're used biblically as the same office. Two different words for the same thing, overseer and elder. Other churches might separate them out where the, the elder is, or the priest is at the local level and then the bishop is one level above, kind of overseeing several churches. That's about the only difference you'll see globally or historically. Listen, guys, every single I'm a huge student of church history and I love all the different parts of the body of Christ. I really do. Every single one of them does this. It's some combination of a presbuteros and an episcopate overseeing the church. That's it. Every church has that historically and globally, except for some very modern like Protestant churches. Sometimes they don't do that. That is basically the definition of a church in the New Testament. People like Paul, apostles, would go and plant a church, and it was important to them that they establish godly elders in that church before they left. 
godly presbyteresses. <laughs> now, uh, here's the reason I say that to you. It's because I think for a lot of us, especially if you either haven't thought about this before, it can feel kind of unsettling. And if you've been hurt by a church or hurt by a leader in the church, this kind of thing can sound horrifying. And, and please don't hear me poo-pooing that or saying that that's silly and you need to get over it. The only thing I do want to say is the answer cannot be isolation. It can't even be you and your Christian friends off in isolation. It might be having to do the hard work of, of finding a healthy church with healthy biblical elders running it. But it, it can't be isolation. Now, I, I really love this. In 1 Timothy, Paul gives a list for the kind of person that an elder should be. And uh, I'm not going to do a long teaching on this, but it's pretty everyday kind of things. These, these guys are basically dads. That's kind of basically the job description. Able to teach, husband of one wife, good reputation, believing children, not a new believer. It kind of sounds like it's a dad with good character. And, and I think there's a reason for that. The New Testament never says these are the only leaders in the church. Never says these are the only offices in the church. It just says these are the guys who have responsibility in the local church. That's, that's what it says. There's a ton of other offices, and I don't have any time to talk about any of that today. And it doesn't say that these guys have to be super gifted. It says able to teach. doesn't mean they have to teach. What it basically says is that they're not new believers and they have high, high proven godly character. That's basically what it says. And are you really going to tell me that this world doesn't need more of us being led and shepherded by good dads? Don't we all kind of need that in our lives? You can find that, and I believe we have that here at Wellspring. It's, it's worth its weight in gold. These guys are not uh, rulers per se. They're, they have responsibility. It's their responsibility. One of the things you see in church history, the Roman persecutions, the Muslim persecutions of Christians, is that they'll come after the presbyteros, the elder, the priest. They'll come after him first. He's the one they're going to... They might leave the church alone, but they're going to kill that guy. They're going to take that guy off to prison. And the way that you know that you're being shepherded by that kind of elder is if they're laying their lives down for the sheep every day. If they lead as servants. If they're domineering leaders like the leaders of the world, that's not probably a godly elder. If they're laying their lives down for the sheep, if they're the kind of person that you think, I believe that that guy would protect me if there was persecution, if there was danger, then you've got yourself a group of godly elders. Value them love them, and dare I say, this is a bad word today, but submit to them. I've been super blessed in my life by learning how to do that and learning to value it. Well, here's a few things. Uh, my friends, I could tell you a million things, but here's a few things that I think uh, are, are ways that you can perhaps live out your faith with other believers within the context of the church. One, taking care of the poor. We've talked about that a good bit already. Another one, uh, receiving wisdom. I talked about that a little bit already. You're not going to be able to give yourself uh, wisdom probably. When, when you're sitting in a certain seat, you're not going to be able to see what's around the bend. People that have been there before, often older people, are the people that can give you that. And again, please don't hear me saying that everything you do has to be done through the local church. I'm, I'm, we have a church that's awesomely entrepreneurial when it comes to kingdom stuff. There's like missions organizations and organizations that do amazing things. I'm not trying to say that they shouldn't be doing those. Far from it. And the fact that they're here, a part of a local church, actually shows that they are doing what I'm trying to say, which is don't try to get out there alone. Don't try to make that thing your church. And if possible, make sure that there's sort of even like a formal relationship with the local church uh, as it says in Hebrew, so that your soul can be overseen. Someone's watching over your soul for you. You need that. I'm going to skip down to this one. Another one is fighting sin. You guys, fighting sin together is one of the secrets of Christianity that I've learned. I think I've shared, I know I've shared with the youth group, 
as a young man trying to fight against uh, lust and, and temptation towards doing things about my lust. Um, I often would pray for myself, and that didn't work for me. Didn't work well for me. But when I got other people to pray for me, I would say I saw about a 90% success rate. I remember I would come out of my room. Sometimes I was struggling with lustful thoughts. I would come out of my room and go find my roommates, and they're like just in the kitchen making Hot Pockets or whatever, whatever single guys do. <laughs> and I would say, guys, I'm struggling with lustful thoughts. Can you pray for me? And they're like, okay. Uh, God, please tell Nathan not to have lustful thoughts. Amen. <laughs> and I would go back to bed. Almost always success at that point. And I don't, I don't know if it's just the simple act of just being vulnerable and just letting people know, but fighting sin with others is such a good way to fight sin. And here's another huge one. Wrestling with doubts. Wrestle with your doubts with other believers. I had an extraordinary experience, which I didn't know was extraordinary at the time. But I lived with some roommates, and we would do like, uh, you know, like roommate dates where we would try to like go and one-on-one -on -one and get a burger and get to know each other better. So I was hanging out with this dude, and uh, we were just, I thought we were just chatting. Like he's like, what do you think about this question about the Bible? What do you think about this question? I don't remember what, I don't remember what we talked about. He was picking my brain on some topics. We were chatting and it was great and I really enjoyed it and I shared my thoughts and he shared his thoughts. And then like a year later, we're at church and he's actually preaching that day. And he starts talking about this conversation that he had with me and how he was this close to losing his faith because of these questions. And he's like weeping and he's like, Nathan, you saved my Christianity for me. <laughs> and I had no clue. I thought we were just talking. But he chose, rather than just to jump ship, he chose to talk some of these things through with another believer. And for him, that completely changed his story. And band, I'll go ahead and invite you guys on up. And I'll close with this. One of the things I'm really excited about, about our church, is, is our endeavor to be what we call a word and spirit church. There's a church that moves in the power of God and that's also rooted in strong biblical theology. But that doesn't just mean that we read the Bible. Every church that loves the Holy Spirit loves the Bible, in my experience. At least they think they do. But we also want to move in the power of the Spirit without repeating the mistakes of the past, which means being a careful student of theology and of, and of church history, of talking to other Christians, talking to other churches. If we, and we have already see, if we see God do something amazing to not think, well, now we don't need to listen to anybody. Now we don't need to learn from anybody. Or this, this thing, a lot of us Holy Spirit people will do this. Well, it's a new season now. They thought it was a new season in the 50s. They were stupid, but it really is a new season now. And so we think that the old ways don't apply to us. The, the wisdom isn't going to work on us. I don't know. We don't want to do that. We want to be a word and spirit church, which means we take understanding the things of God seriously. It means we talk to each other. We listen to each other. Jesus told the woman, remember the woman at the well? He told her in John 4 that the Father was looking for those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. Is that amazing to you? God's looking for you. If you're willing to worship in the power of the Spirit and rooted in truth, then God is looking for you. He wants that. So let's do that. And let's make sure we're doing it together. Well, Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for a church uh, that wants to be a church, that wants to be a body. I thank you, God, that you haven't called us to do it by ourselves. How precious that is, God. Even when it feels like it's too slow or frustrating or that people don't get what we're trying to say, I pray that you would um, give us the humility to not forsake one another. I thank you, God, that there's so much room within the church for so many different types of gifts and ministries. And that we're always gonna do them uh, with more strength when we rely on each other's gifts, God. Because when you pour out your spirit, you don't give all the gifts to one or two. 
God, you distribute your gifts among all of us so that none of us can boast in ourselves. All of us can boast in what you are doing through us, your bride. And we thank you for all of it, God, and we worship you. Amen.